I've seen children defy their parents' authority. And sometimes parents will tell children to do something and the child will respond, no, I'm not going to do it. Or they just won't do it. And I've seen some refer to that, I've heard some refer to that as the child has a mind of his own. Or he's a strong-willed child. They've got books written on that. He's a strong-willed child. That's why he behaves that way. Sometimes parents laugh at that kind of behavior. Some parents say it's cute. When God's children don't do what he tells them to do, God also has a name for it. God doesn't think it's cute. God doesn't think, God doesn't call it having a mind of their own. God doesn't refer to it as this is a strong-willed child. God calls it disobedience. In the book of Judges chapter 6, the Israelites were once again disobedient to the Lord. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And they did this again and again and again. And because of this, God gave them over to their enemy, the Midianites. The Midianites were very oppressive to the Israelites. They treated the Israelites with disrespect. They treated the Israelites with contempt. They handled the Israelites abusively. The Midianites moved into Israelite territory and took over everything they had, took over their land, took over their houses, took over everything. Imagine someone walking up to your house and kicking your front door down, going in your house, throwing you out, and taking over everything you own, all your food, all your furniture, all your fine clothing, and kicking you out of your own house. You try and gather a few sentimental things, and they say, no, you can't take nothing with you. So you go to get in your car to leave, and they say, you can't even take the car, just go. That's what the Midianites did to the Israelites. Judges chapter 6 says the Midianites, they ruined the Israelites' crops. Everything they planted, the Midianites ruined it so that they would not be able to survive. In response, the Israelites ran away and hid in the mountains. That was their first Mistake. That's not what they should have done. For the book of Psalms chapter 50 and verse 15 says this. Call on me in the day of trouble, says the Lord, and I will rescue you so that you may honor me. Psalms chapter 18 and verse 3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Psalms chapter 46 and verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. The Israelites, instead of running and hiding from the enemies, should have first called on the name of God. This is the same God who delivered Joseph from prison, the same God who delivered Moses from the grips of death, the same God who delivered Daniel from the mouth of lions, the same God who delivered Jeremiah from that hole in the ground where they threw him and left him to die. And just as God delivered these great servants, God will also deliver us. There's no situation too difficult for God to deliver us from. Judges chapter 6, the children of Israel finally cried out to the Lord. They finally did what they should have done to begin with. The children of Israel picked up the life preserver. The life preserver was there all along. 
And instead of putting on the life preserver, they took matters into their own hands. The life preserver that God has given us is prayer. But you've got to use the life preserver for it to save your life. They had the life preserver all along, but they just did not put it on. The purpose of the life preserver is to save lives. I'm getting tied up in my mic string and everything. The purpose of, of the life preserver, if you can put it on, is to save lives. Now, if you were on a ship, that's rubbing the mic, isn't it? If you were on a ship and the ship was sinking, you wouldn't jump off the ship, leave the life preserver behind, try and swim to shore, and then when you can't make it, try and swim back to the ship to get the life preserver. No, before you jump off the ship, you would first put on the life preserver. That's not what Israel did. They jumped straight off the ship without the life preserver. When problems came into their lives, instead of crying out to God immediately through prayer, the life preserver, they took matters into their own hands. God should have been there first course of action. Instead, they use God as a last resort. God does not like being used as a last resort. God does not like being a backup plan. God does not like being plan B. Communication with God must be our first course of action rather than our last Resort. Prayer to God must be our first course of action rather than our last resort. The Israelites tried to handle their situation themselves without first crying out to God. And when we try to handle things ourselves, when we try to handle things our way, we are demonstrating to God that we don't need him, that we don't trust him that we don't have faith in his ability to take care of us. We're saying, God, I got this. I don't need you. Nothing but trouble awaits us down that road, if that's the road we take. It is offensive to God when we look for other ways to resolve problems without calling on him first. It demonstrates that we do not trust him. Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, what did you mean by that, Ben? He means it is better to try to keep a bad thing from happening than to try to fix a bad thing once it has happened. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 55 and verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Yeah. Prayer should not be used as a just in case. Prayer must not be used as a just in case. Prayer is a life preserver that must be used as a first course of action, not as a last resort. Prayer, communication with God is this life preserver. It's like a bulletproof vest. If the ship was sinking, you don't jump overboard without the life preserver, try and make it on your own. No, you put on the life preserver first. In the same way, prayer, when we find ourselves, or before trouble comes, don't try to make it on our own. We'll only have to fall back on God anyway. If you were going off to war, you wouldn't wait until the shots start being fired, bullets are flying. You wouldn't wait until that point to put on the bulletproof vest. You'd put it on before the battle started. It's the same with prayer. Prayer must be our first course of action, not a matter of last 
resort. The purpose of prayer is not to call on God after we find ourselves in trouble. The purpose of prayer is to have a close communication relationship with God to keep us out of trouble or to sustain us through trouble. If you were drowning and someone was getting ready to throw you a life preserver, you wouldn't say, hold on, I've got some other things that I'm going to try here. Go on and keep that. No, you would gladly receive that life preserver because if the life preserver is not used, death can be the result. If the bulletproof vest is not used, death can be the result. If prayer is not used, death will be the result. There's no way for us to win this battle against Satan without prayer. One of the biggest tragedies is to find the body of someone who was drowned and within reach of their body is a life preserver. One of the biggest tragedies is to find God's people drowning in all kinds of trouble and within reach is the life preserver of prayer. Songwriter put it this way, oh what peace we often forfeit. Oh what needless pain we bear. And it's all because we do not carry everything, everything, everything to God in prayer. Prayer, calling on God, must be our first course of action, not our last resort. We must make contact with God first. Now, I usually don't call people out in public because I ain't that way. But I'm making an exception this morning. Brother Hampton's one of the nicest people I know. But y'all, I got to tell you, he did us bad the other day. We went bowling, and I thought it was a friendly fellowship that we were having. Now with Brother Hampton. He beat us bad. Now he started out acting like he couldn't bowl very well. But y'all, he put a whipping on us. He didn't have to do that. He could have gone easy on us. He didn't do that. He beat us like we stole something. But I'm not the type to call people out like that. I don't know much about Ella, you're an exception. I'm not what you would call a good bowler. But I understand that in order to get a strike, you've got to hit that head pin. And from some research I did, there's some people who can go from behind. I'm not talking about that. Generally speaking, to get a strike, you've got to hit that head pin or a combination of the head pin and some other pins. But you've got to hit the head pin first. That's the way it is in our relationship with God. We have got to go to God first. The Israelites... They took matters into their own hands. They, they, they tried to take care of themselves instead of first calling on the name of the Lord. They tried to fix the problem on their own without God. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed, cursed is the one who trusts in man who draws his strength from mere flesh who draws his strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. God is able to do some mighty things through his power that's already at work within us. The ability for us to negotiate through life's problems, through life's hardships, through life's difficulty is already present within us. Songwriter said, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble Anywhere. We should never be discouraged. What should we do? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Remember when we were baptized, God put in each one of us his precious spirit. That spirit is not dead. That spirit is very much alive. That spirit is ready 
willing and able to do some mighty things in us. I like watching the rodeo. I'm not a Texas-born person, but when I came to Texas, I kind of fell in love with that. I like watching these guys try to stay on the back of a bull who doesn't want them on their back. I never understood that kind of logic, but I like watching that. When they're in the chute before the, the gate is open, that bull is just banging that chute, trying to get out before they open that, that, that chute. He's doing everything to try and bust that door open. That's the way God's spirit is in us. That bull wants to get out so he can go to work and shake this fool off his back. God's spirit is in us, eagerly waiting to get out and work through us to do wonderful things. It was not God's intention that his spirit remain in us and do nothing. It was not God's intention that his spirit remain in us and be inactive. It was God's intention that his spirit do in us, through us, with us, things that we are incapable of doing on our own. Yeah. One of the differences between us and Jesus yeah. is this. Right. He was sinless. We are sinful. Why was Jesus sinless? Jesus was sinless because he relied on his father to get him out of situations that he was unable to get out of himself. That's why Jesus was sinless. We're sinful because we fail to rely on God's spirit the way Jesus did. Rely on God's spirit to get us out of situations that we are incapable of getting out of ourselves. That's why Jesus prayed so much. And when Jesus said to, to the disciples, stay here, I'm going over to the other side of the sea. Stay here, I'm going up on this mountain. Jesus did that. He separated himself from them because he wanted time with him and his father. Jesus was going through difficulties. Remember, he was tempted in every way, just like you are, you, 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 and me. He was tempted just like we are, but he did not sin. And the reason he did not sin is because he relied completely on his father to help him do what he himself could not do. And you and I, we've got that same power within us. You know, when the devil backs us into a corner and we look left and we look right and there's no way out, that's because we're looking in the wrong direction. We need to be looking up. Psalmist said, I will look to the hills. Seemed like you all read that passage. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. You need to come up here and do this. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We all have within us power. But more than that, because we have God's spirit, we have supernatural power. Every one of us that's got the spirit of God in us, we have supernatural power. Supernatural means above and beyond what is normal. You and I have within us powers above and beyond what is normal. When I was young, I used to watch a show that started this way. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful. Y'all watch that show too. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to do what? Leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman, isn't it? Yes, it's Superman. Strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities, here it is, beyond those of mortal men. Now turn in your New Testaments, please, to the book of Ephesians. I want you to read this with me. Keep in mind Superman and all his superpowers 
as we read Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do infinitely more than all we ask or even imagine through his power that is at work within us. Now to him, that's God, he's talking about God, who is able to do infinitely more than all we could even come up with, all we could think or even imagine. And he does it according to the power that's where? At work in you and you and you and you and you. That's at work within all of us. All of us have supernatural Abilities. I don't know if God wants us to leap tall buildings in a single bound. If he does, I know we can do it though. He said that God is ready. God is willing. God is able to do magnificent things. We're selling ourselves short. God is just waiting to use us to do all these great things through his power. It's living in us. Because we have his spirit. This ain't normal stuff. This is supernatural ability. This is God doing unbelievable stuff in us. This is God doing unbelievable stuff through us. This is God doing unbelievable stuff with us. God using our hands, our feet, our minds to accomplish his divine purpose. After all, that's what it's all about, isn't it? God's divine purpose. It's not about us. It is not about us. It is all about God and his divine purpose. Now I know it can get confusing after we, we post ourselves all over Facebook. We post on there who we are, what we have, what we've done. You would think it's all about us. But it's not. It's about God and his divine purpose. We love ourselves, don't we? We think everybody wants to see us. We think everybody wants to hear what we have to say. But it's about loving God and hearing and doing what he has to say. I'm not saying Facebook is wrong. I just want us to be clear. It ain't about us. It's about God and his divine purpose. James says, that's where your problem is. Your problems start because you forget that it's about God and think it's about yourself. That's what James said, you're selfish. The fact that we have God ready, willing, and able to resolve our problems and yet we resort to other means and other measures shows that we do not trust God to do what he said he would do. Yeah. Too often we use prayer as a last resort, but God wants prayer to be our first course of action. Yeah. We pray when there's nothing else we can do. God wants us to pray before anything else. Yeah. Songwriter said, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What would be different in our lives if going to God was our first course of action? How would our lives change if going to God was our first course of action instead of a last resort? Songwriter said, I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. Yeah. Seems like y'all been in the same songbook I've been in. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, dear Lord, close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. The Israelites were disobedient. 
to God. He was their life preserver. He was their first course of action, but they used God as a backup plan. What about you? Are you relying on God as your life preserver? Or is God just a backup plan? If this morning your relationship with God is not what it should be, you've had God on the back burner and you've been in the driver's seat. If that relationship needs to be changed, we invite you to make that change this morning. Please do so while we stand and sing. And Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See.